In this video, we're going to continue on with the discussion of rigging, skinning, and animating your skeletal mesh objects, uh, how to create the, the skeletal mesh files, how to create your animation files, um, and how to create this kind of placement bone structure that's easy to place and kind of replicate these skeletal mesh objects throughout your, your room in Unity, and then how to bring everything into Unity and test out the animations. So on the scene right now, the screen right now, you can see that I have uh, Maya open and I have um, this room. It's all ready, um, Unity ready. Uh, you see that I have on uh, the outliner, I have the, the group that all the meshes are underneath and I kind of just have them organized by the furniture and the, the architecture structure. So if I go into the room and I, I turn on the shaded key, um, the first thing I'm going to do is look around the room and notice that I have a few objects that are the same. So I have this large rounded vase here done out four times. Um, I have this kind of corner lamp done out four times, well actually three, but you know he could, I could just duplicate them out and put them in this corner. So that means when I animate I create a skeletal mesh of this vase and I create some animations I can easily you know uh, place this one skeletal mesh object in unity four times over you know so I'm just going to create this one object one animation for it and I'll duplicate them four times throughout the room and so in unity you can like manually place it or you can we can create this uh, placement bone structure here in Maya that'll make things um, easier when it's time to bring into the game. So the other things uh, you see that these vases are doubled out too and so I'm going to take a look around the room and see what I'd like to animate. So first off if I open up my outliner and I find these vases, I'll see that, um, again, you know, most of the time these kind of revolve surfaces, uh, if you did the revolve command and forget to get put them into poly, you'll notice that they're NURBS. You know, you'll see this blue icon for NURBS. And again, we, we're not going to be able to handle that in the game engine. So remember, go to modify, convert NURBS to polygons. Um, the default is to have this setting at three. Um, and when I did that, um, you could take a look at one of these objects and just see that there's too much resolution. I see that there's about 2,000 faces, 4,000 tries. So I'm going to undo that. And um, I lowered these settings down to two and clicked apply. And you'll notice that they're still high, but um, it's a little bit more manageable. Uh, basically, I cut the numbers in half. So I could try lowering it down some more and, you know, obviously optimizing it for the game. But for these purposes, I think that's good. So I want to delete the NURBS that are in the scene. And I'm going to move the polygons <coughs> objects into their appropriate grouping. Um, and I can start to um, break these out. So... Uh, again, thinking as a skeletal mesh, you know, we're going to have this one group that's kind of like the static mesh. It's not going to be animated. It, it's going to be the root, uh, the room. So you're going to pull out objects that you're going to want to start to animate. And since I just did that conversion, let me, um, it, it doesn't have a name right now. So remember with the SKs, you're indicating that they're skeletal meshes. So skeletal mesh Vaz 1. Uh, this lamp here. I'm going to want to use, it looks like there is a lamp over in this corner, it's just hidden. So I'm just going to show it. Oh, uh, nope. Just sitting on the same one. But I can take that lamp. And um, if we're going to go with this symmetry that, you know, everything's in the corner of the room, I'll just move him over. <clears throat> one more object that will be animating. So let me take this lamp pull him out, you know, we'll call him SK Lamp, he's the first lamp, um, and we could animate these vases too, um, right now I'm going to do with this vase, this lamp, and see if I can, maybe this monitor will be good to animate because 
um, we might, this might get into some soft skinning um, with the neck piece here. So maybe I can pull out this computer monitor, rename him SK Computer Monitor. Let's put a number, start to serialize them. All uh, right, so we have a vase, a lamp, this computer monitor. We see over here that this vase and lamp is the same, so they'll be, you know, I'll be reusing those skeletal meshes in these areas, and they'll be animating. Um, and this guy's pretty interesting. I might be able to have some fun with him. Uh, he's pretty unique, so I can um, take him out, and I'll create a skeletal mesh for him. And I think that's about all I'll, I'll animate in the scene. The rest will just be static. So I have four skeletal meshes here, and one of them will, will have, definitely have to involve some, some soft binding <clears throat> to get some, some organic deformation on that, the neck piece of this monitor here. All right. So once I've kind of established my skeletal meshes are outside the room, um, I'm, I'm, this is kind of, um, now it's not a file that's appropriate for Unity, you know, because I have both my, my static room and now I'm building out these skeletal meshes all in one scene. So actually this is a modifiable file um, that I'll be taking Unity ready files out of. So we kind of call them like master files or they're animation files that the animators are working with. So I have a, um, a folder now um, under scenes, these were kind of the scenes I was using. I, I kind of creating a separate folder, Unity Room, because there's going to be a lot of files in here. So it's it, you know, let's just um, start to organize a bit. So you know, I'll call this um, the Eric Room Master File. You know, this isn't for Unity. You don't need to do an FBX file of this. This is just going to contain all your. It's going to contain your static meshes, your skeletal meshes, your animation scenes, and we'll show you how to bake them out. All right, so um, first off, um, you see I've kind of identified a skeletal mesh, but you see it's going to be placed around this room maybe four times, but the other ones happen to be static meshes. So these, these static mesh ones are good to know um, for placement purposes. Um, we're going to leave them in there for now, but eventually we'll, we'll create like a placement bone um, hierarchy. Very similar to how we do a static mesh bone hierarchy. So let me show you, the, let me review the static mesh hierarchy, and that will lead into um, how to create this kind of placement bones. So if I take uh, the vase that's meant to be a skeletal mesh in my room, um, let me turn on visibility. There's a nice spot, there's a nice vertex sitting right at the base of this vase, right in the center. That's perfect for uh, starting our bone hierarchy. Because remember, you want your root and you want kind of your object bone. The root is just for placement. You're going to actually animate on your object bone. So, and you kind of want the root kind of where this object will be sitting. So basically at its base in the center. So again, in the skeleton, we have our joint tool. Um, let me turn on wireframe. You can see the actual vertex, and I can see that I'm in the joint tool because I have this crosshair thing going. So if I hold the V key, meaning snap to vertex, snap to point that you see right here, I can click, and my joint is right at the base, right where this vertex is, which happens to be a perfect placement. So that's going to be my root. Um, and I want to, um, you know, since this is, he's not going to break apart or anything. He's just one big object. Um, he, there's no separate parts that are animating, and he's also not going to have any type of soft deforming. Um, all I need is an object bone to animate on to, for the whole thing. So I'm going to want the object bone to be up in the center here, but an easy way to deal with that, you know, I can't just click in the center. I can hold vertex key and snap it, but it's going to snap to one of these vertices that are on the outside. And then I kind of have to manually move everything. I'm sorry, manually move that one bone, but I have to move it 
left and right or forward and backward. I have to use two axes to get it in the proper placement. But if I, I place it on the root again, I can hold the V key, snap it there so it's sitting right exactly where the root is. And I see I have joint one, joint two. And uh, let me rename these so uh, it's more obvious. Obviously, the top one in the hierarchy is going to be the root. So I can call it BN. It's going to be Vaso1. Remember, it's BN for bone, then the object you're working with, and then the actual bone name. It'll be root. I can copy this, and then the child of root will be object. That's what we're animating on. And I can just move him up. Oops, sorry, I have the root. Click the object and just move him up. And since I placed him right at the root, he's right in the center of mass of this um, object. So all I actually have to do is move it up and down to find the uh, appropriate place where I can want to animate it on. So I think here, kind of at its widest point, um, is a good place to place the object bone. So you see how it's very easy. The object bone is right in the middle of this whole thing. Looks good. All right, so we have our root in our object, and let me middle mouse drag it underneath the vase here. So we're starting to organize our skeletal meshes. I have my mesh of my vase and my bone of my vase. And again, um, the root's replacement, we don't skin onto the root. So I'm gonna select the object bone and then control click the vase, the, the mesh. Go skin, bind skin, and we're going to do the smooth binding, but I'm doing options, because remember if you do joint hierarchy, it's going to bind the vase to the whole joint hierarchy, meaning the root will also have some influence there. I don't want that. I want just the selected joints, which I have is just the object. So click bind, and now you see as I move the object bone, the whole vase moves. Uh, just a quick note, someone in class was asking, is this the only way to animate? And the question is no. Um, you can animate right on an object. So I can, just like you move something for placement or scale it or rotate it, you can actually key on that, and that's an animation too. Um, so in my timeline, if I press, if I click this lamp, press the S key, you notice everything turned red. And I move forward in my timeline, and I move this thing, I press the S key, and I scrub the timeline. You see my vase is animating. You see these numbers move. Right here, translate X. All right. And this is an animation, too. But this will not come into the game engine. It's not a clean way of doing it for game purposes, for cinematic purposes where you're rendering out of Maya and it's for a commercial, a movie, uh, a short film, uh, for your demo reels, you know, this is very acceptable. It's just for games, this is not. So with the object selected, I can just delete all these keys very easily, saying edit, keys, and then delete keys. That's why we're gonna use this bone system. Um, and also when you're animating right on objects, you're not gonna be able to get soft deforming. You know, um, for organic objects, for characters and creatures, um, and most of the time you're get, there's some element of soft deforming going on and you definitely need a bone structure to do that. So just get used to um, creating this bone structure for animation purposes. So, I have my mesh and my bone structure, my vase, and now I can start an animation. So um, again, as we talked about in the timeline here, we kind of only have half the timeline um, available to us, one to 24, but it really goes out to 48 for this, for default. I mean, I can move this out. I can go up to 96 or, you know, and and open this up. You know, it you can set whatever time you want, but um, for this purposes, Remember to be use your whole timeline that's available to you. Um, you only shorten it up if you want to focus on animation on a smaller segment. But usually you're going to open it up. 48 frames, we're doing 24 frames per second. So this is two seconds of animation. Um, and we could just animate on the object bone. So to create loopable animations, remember set the key at the beginning 
everything turned red on the object bone, not on the root. And then go to the end frame, set the key. So now you're, you have the same values at the start and end of your animation. So you can um, proceed to set keys and it will always want to return back to its original location so we have a loopable animation. So here I'm just I'm just trying to get like a wobbling vase maybe it's about to fall over or something but you see that it returns back and you can just play it over and over. I just clicked the play button here and you can see the timeline just going over and over and over again and it's just kind of wobbling. But you see that the, the wobble doesn't really look good. So now that you kind of set out your initial um, keys, um, you can edit them to get um, a better, you know, refined animation. So that's under Window, Animation Editor is the Graph Editor. This is how you're going to want to refine your animations using these curves. So first select your object It's that you want to manipulate the keys on. For me, that's the object bone of the vase. You can click this button to frame up on all the animation. Uh, right off the bat, you can see the translation is just flatlined. It's not moving anywhere. I'm just rotating it. Um, and same with scale, it's flatlined. So we're really only concerned with the rotation here. And these lines are um, the black dots are where I'm placing my animation keys here on the timeline, the red ticks. And this is Maya interpolating between those ticks. Um, so you can look at these curves and see that they're kind of <clears throat> like sharp transitions. There's like a quick change in the slope here. So that's why it's, it's such a jerky animation. You kind of want to smooth stuff out. So usually um, it's best to focus on one curve at a time now, uh, blue is rotate X, green is rotate Y, and red is rotate uh, X. So let's focus on that. It's usually focus on the major players first. So um, I see that blue is really prevalent. He's really moving around a lot. So let's look at rotate Z and try and manipulate this a little bit to clean it out. Um, first thing I can notice is that... Uh, there's a, a high chain, a really sharp, drastic change between these points here. Um, I can press the R key and then middle mouse drag, and I can actually scale the difference between them. You see that? Um, you can press the W key and move them. Um, but I'm actually seeing that there's a drastic difference between this all. So I'm going to scale this out and get a nice, try and get a, a more even um, movement between these locations, these these keys. So let's just see, I just changed that rotate X. So let's see how that is kind of working. It's a little s smoother, but he's still pretty jerky. Um, yeah, you see my graph editor is empty because I didn't select the object bone. So let me go back and select the object bone and let's deal with these rotations a bit more. So we could deal with, um, I can move these points around with the W key and actually move them around individually and try and get some smoother effect going on here. So I'm just kind of randomly moving them around to uh, get a bit of a softer animation going on. Um, I guess just still we'll still stick with uh, rotate. You might note with rotate Z, you might notice that now there's more ticks on the line. And that's because I actually, we have more animation placements, more keys. That's only because I moved those rotate Z around. Like this, this key right here only has a rotate um, Z information. Um, and you can see that a bit. Let me show you in the dope sheet. This is the second animation window that you'll be using a lot. 
So this basically just shows the ticks along the timeline here. And it shows that there's an animation key here. It doesn't say anything more than that. But if I open it up, especially in uh, Rotate, this actually shows you the rotation. So up at the top here, it says there's a key on this object bone. And then if you look down the list, it says there's a key on everything. There's a key on the visibility, the translation. I mean, I can even open these up. This thing, there's a key on all the translations, all the rotations, all the scales. Now here, at frame 8, it says there's a key on this object bone, and it's right here. It's only a, there's only a rotation key, and it's only on the, the rotate Z. And then at frame 12 here, it says there's a key, and actually it's on the visibility, it's on the translation, it's on the rotation, but not on the rotate axis on the scale. That's because I grabbed that key and I, I moved it and it's actually placed over here. So just be aware of um, how these keys are placed. And if there's too many keys, you know, and you're getting confused what's going on, it's um, good to start deleting stuff. Like scaling, I'm never actually messing around with the scaling. So you can, oops, my phone, let me open it back up. You can like grab all the scaling keys and you can delete them. Same with the uh, visibility. Visibility is making it invisible or not. It's a very useful animation technique, but we're not dealing we're not dealing with visibility. I can delete that. Same with translation. We're not actually moving this thing for in this situation. We're just rotating around, making it look like it wobbles. So I can delete that. And all we're left with is rotation keys. So again, if I go into Graph Editor, you see that all the rest is gone. It's just rotation. Very helpful. And actually, if you look here, you see that the translation, scaling, visibility, they're not red anymore. It means they're not, they're not keyed. We only have rota um, rotation keys. Um, and everything that's placed here is only dealing with the rotation. So it's a little bit easier to read. Um, <clears throat> So it's helpful to only key what exactly it is that you're interested in, in manipulating. Um, so let's see with moving the rotate around. He looks a little softer. Um, but we still have some issues. So let's see, we have the rotate Y. Um, he, he's looking pretty soft, right? But he might... Maybe we could use a little bit uh, more of a variation with these points. And then this one is really low, so maybe we can adjust him a little bit to be a little softer um, motion up and down. And then rotate X, like he's, he starts good um, softly, but you see these two points are really extreme. So I can press the R key and middle mouse drag them to kind of equalize them out a bit. And maybe press the W key and move them down and now we have a bit of a nice um, a nicer animation curve for this purpose. So if I play it, it looks like he's just kind of getting jostled a little bit. Um, you know, maybe we could add a, a robot next to him, you know, next week where he, the robot's kind of shaking it or he's like cleaning it or, or bumping into it over and over again. So maybe at a certain point, maybe he kind of dips a little bit. Maybe I could take this Y animation and dip it down. Just see what that looks like. Oh, not much. Let's move it down a little bit more. Oh, rotate Y happens to be... Um, just doing this, rotating about his axis. So maybe we want a, uh, another rotation. Maybe that's not really doing much. Maybe we want like a rotate X. Maybe just take one of them and dip them down a little bit. All right. For now, I'm going to leave that alone. Um, the animation alone. Now, as far as the root goes, this, this will be interesting later on for placement, um, and I'll get into that in a bit. But let's get on to um, the vase here. Um, uh, what we could do with him 
is um, maybe we could add a few, if you notice there's no edge loops at all um, going up the the collar, the um, the uh, the staff of this, uh, we might maybe we could add a few edge loops, and um, that would enable us to. You notice it's placing four at once, so I must have this on multiple loops. Let me just undo that. Go into interactive edge loop tool. Yeah, I have like placing four loops, so that's fine. We'll place four loops in there. And um, see what we could do with it. Um, so again, the same process is going to be animation, skeleton, joint tool. Uh, let me look through, uh, make x-ray and look at the... Um, Placements again, it's going to be good to just place them right in the center here, and I could just kind of move them up. So maybe I'll put one root at the base of him, maybe one I'm going to move up to the different levels. And uh, there's four edge loops, so maybe four bones, and I'll put one in the, the head up of the shaft up at the top. So I could hold the um, V key. And that's one joint. I'm going to want one for the root, four for like the four edge loops, and one at the top. So maybe six. I'm just holding the V key and just keep clicking. And you see now I'm up to joint six. So that's good. I'll press return. Um, bring up my outliner. I can hold the shift key and click. And it'll open up the entire joint hierarchy. So we're going to be dealing with the lamp here. Copy that name. And again, there's going to be BN. And it'll be the root. I copy this, copy this out, and um, see what would the names be. Um, I'm just going to start calling them object 01 and up. I don't really have any descriptive names for these two. Three, four, and then that top one just happens to be the shade, so I'll just call it the shade. So I'm going to move them up. You can see at the edge loops right there. I'm going to hold the V key and just click on the up arrow, and I can snap it. And it moved all the ones underneath them. So now all these are in this location, and the root is still at the base. So I can go up to the second object, pop him up one. Go to the next, and the next, holding the V key, hold the V key again, and pop them into the shade a bit. <clears throat> All right, so we kind of have a, a joint chain going up the center here. You see if I bend it at this end, um, he's bending at um, this bone here. So if I go ahead and um, and do an initial, I can select the um, the root and just move this up here. So we have the mesh and then we have the bone structure. I'm going to actually select object one, two, three, four, and the shade, and select the lamp. Because remember, I don't want to skin the the root. Smooth bind just to select the joints, bind it. Let's see what's going on here. So I can grab it at um, object one, which is actually the the base is bound to it. So let's see. Okay, this is looking pretty good. And you see at the bottom is kind of skin to him. And then we got going up. So and then we just have the shade. So he's looking kind of good. You see that there's, there's some skinning issues that we're going to have to deal with. Um, another thing to note is when I bend this and we look at this geometry, let me um, hide, show, I can hide the, the bones, make it see clear. It's just bending at that one um, 
at that one edge loop and you see it's kind of a harsh bend so what we can do is let's um, skin let's detach the skin and let's modify this another thing to note is that um, we're gonna have to deal with is that he's kind of faceted um, you know we don't have like a soft softest um, fall off between these faces so we're also going to have to um, do a few things to here. Let's go into polygons menu. We can, you know, soften the edge under normals. But before we do that, um, I want to take these edges that I'm kind of bending at. I'm going to select them. So that's one, two, three, four. Okay, I have all four of them right now. What I'm going to want to do is uh, I can do a bevel. What I want to do is I want to add an edge on an edge loop or on each side of these edges to help with a more of a soft bend. And a quick way to do that is you can do a bevel. Click apply. And they look like they're, let me check this offset on this bevel. I can shrink it up. Okay, and do segments. Here we go. So if you do usually do two segments and do a small offset, what's happening here is this was my <clears throat> this was my original edge loop here, and now I have another one up here, another one below it. So this will help. So when it bends, um, we're gonna have another edge loop above and below to help support a more of a you know it's not so facet, it's not such a hard edge bend. So you see I have some shading issues. All you do is basically just reassign a shader um, to it, to whatever its shader was. Um, chair. Foz lamp, lamp base. Okay, first off that helps the shading now that like it applies the shader correctly on everything. It's just a strange thing, it sometimes happens. Um, the other thing is very faceted, so I can click the lamp and say set normal angles. So it makes a soft transition when it's under 30 degree difference between the faces that we talked about. So this vase is good, nice and clean. The only other thing I want to make sure is it's got history now built up on it from everything I did. Just say edit, click the lamp and do delete the history. Now he's clean. Um, let's bring back our joint chain. It was hidden. So again, let's select the joints, select the lamp. And let's go into animation, say skin bind smooth. I, I didn't check, you know, it was the same options, which is um, <clears throat> just uh, skin with the selected high joints. Uh, again, this joint isn't really going to animate because uh, he's kind of holding the base on the ground. But I kind of imagine the, the, the lamp turning. Um, it's like one of those adjustable lamps. Um, so he's looking good. Obviously, he's not supposed to be controlling this part. But if we look, what's important is that now we're getting a softer bend here. It's because I added those edge loops using the uh, bevel tool. So at least it's it's helping it a little bit. You know, obviously it it's when you do an extreme move, it's cr crunching. But at least it's a little bit cleaner. You see, like this is um, very important in character animation. Uh, it's rule of threes. Wherever there's a major joint, like the elbow, the wrist, shoulder, whatever, you're supposed to have it, like a th at least three edge loops like this to help support that deformation. So this is looking pretty good as an initial uh, bind. Um, but let's go in and do edit smooth skin and paint skin weights tool. And let's paint this up a bit. So object one, we just want him basically controlling the bottom down here. Um, which he is, and what we can say is add, add, add some value, high value, just paint, just make sure he has kind of like full control over this object. Let me see if I can, yeah, that's good. I just did, um, isolate select up here just so we just see our object. So now object two, we want to do a place value is zero. We don't want him influencing this bottom base. You know, he's just got that one bone holding that base. Um, you can have a slight, maybe like a 5% influence on these here. 
Like there's nothing wrong with him influencing the might get a little soft fall off. So he's kind of has a heavy influence here. Um, again, we want replace with zero. We don't want him having any influencing on the on the the head of the lamp, the shade. So I'll just paint that off. All right. And then again, this this object three is kind of in the middle of the lamp. If you don't know what, which one it is, you can um, click back and you can look at the color of. It's actually just referring to this one. So I'm gonna turn them off and uh, turn off all influence on the lamp base and on the shade. That should be good. Object four, same thing. No influence on the base. Um, and he seems to have a heavy influence here up on the on the shade. Um, which let me just bring back this object four is sitting here, and then we got the shade bone, and he has he's actually not as influential as he needs to be up here. So um, this object four, we don't want him, maybe he can have some influence here. This might be a bendy area, but um, definitely the shade is hard, you know, whether it's plastic or glass or metal or what have you, you know, he really shouldn't have any influence up here. For now, I'll leave his influence here um, just to see what it looks like, but definitely nothing there. And then the shade bone, I'll uh, replace that with 100% up here. You know, he should be uh, fully holding this, this in place, this lampshade, All right? Because we're not going to animate on him. He's just holding it there. So I, I just press the Q key to jump out. So let's um, scale up or frame up. And uh, let's start grabbing, let's see, object two. Looking pretty good. Uh, you can see that he still is having some effect on the base down there. So I'm going to want to skin that a little bit more. But he's looking good. Object three. Same thing. He's influencing the base, but the, the shade looks good. He's, you know, he's, pretty, he's holding solid. So uh, this guy, same thing. They're, they're all having a slight influence on the base, so I got to get rid of that. And then the shade. So the shade looks kind of cool. You see that there's some bad um, edge here. It needs to be a little bit of a softer fall off if we did want to animate this thing. Um, so let me click the lamp again and go back into the paint skin weights. Um, again, these guys have to have replace value of zero on the base down here. These guys still have some type of influence. So I'm, I'm just clicking over and over again. I'm, I'm going to isolate select and constantly just click, left click. Sometimes it's hard to, um, you know, you see there's still a light blue. And you ideally would like to get black, meaning no influence. But it, you really have to get in there sometimes to uh, get rid of it. So let's j jump to object three, bone. <clears throat> and do the same thing, just keep painting and clicking over and over again. And you can, um, there's different ways you can click repeatedly or just do a drag selection and yeah, you're basically forcing a zero influence on these on these vertices here. And again, object one is you know you could try definitely say it was value of one. All right. Um, the other thing, oh, the shade here. Let's do value zero. Make sure he's paint this off. He's got some blue down here. All right. Object one, let's increase that. Just make sure it's definitely 100%. I just don't want to deal with uh, any bending down there. So the other thing, the shade was um, 
looking pretty good. He just needs kind of a softer fall off in this area. So what he can do is a smooth because he's 100% controlling up here and basically 0% down here. So if I shrink down my brush with the B key, um, you can kind of smooth off the difference here. So it's not doing too well. So let's um, add maybe 20, 30% at a clip. There seems to be... Let me shrink this up a bit. There seems to be um, discontinuity in the geometry here. I'll just keep painting. It definitely needs to... I'd have to check this geometry again. It looks like it's not, um, you know, weighted. It looks like it wasn't, um, the topology is not smooth. It looks like there's a break there. But either way, um, I'm just going to try smoothing out the differences here. And just see what it looks like. All right. I'm going to press the Q key. Let's take a look at this again. So object two, it looks good. You notice that there's a floating here. I'm gonna have to clean that up. Object three, same, look, they're looking good. And the shade. All right, so you see there's a disconnect at the bottom parts here. So they seem to be like this geo, I, it seems like um, I didn't do a proper edge flow here, I didn't connect these. these. These are separate parts, and I didn't actually, um, you know, like merge them together and then make sure the vertices were all cleaned up. So I would actually go back and deskin this and fix the geo. I'm not going to do it in this video, but you can see it here. There's a break. See, there's a separation there. So I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to fix the skinning a bit more. Um, but if you see stuff like that, then you know that um, your geo isn't like fully connected. So let me do like um, invisibility. See, you see how the geo comes down through here? See, it's not good. So I'm inside the lamp base, and the the neck of it um, is going is not. So I would have actually fixed this, but it's good to see it if you do have issues like this. So object one. We want to rep our add doesn't matter. Just just basically make sure it's 100% weighted. Object two, obviously we're gonna replace with zero here. You got you can't have any influence in this area. Same with the rest of these. This is no. And object one, again, just make sure it's 100%. Okay. So it looks like object three, four. Okay. The other issue is up here at the sh base of the shade. I guess we're going to see the same thing if I can zoom in here. Yeah, there's... You can see that um, this needed some work, too. So the shade is having no influence on this top part. So it uh, depends how I want to deal with this to animate, but maybe I'll just make him scale it down a little bit. Not 100%, but pretty close color to the bottom here. Let me add a little, just a slight bit so that there's no separation when the shade moves. All right, so let's see how this looks now. So object two, all right, he's bending there. It looks good. There's nothing else really causing issues. The skinning can be cleaned up a bit more, but I got to move ahead in the video. But everything's animating well. Um, I'm going to leave it like this and just go ahead with animation. So I'll bring back the room. Um... And we can start animating on this uh, object. So again, um, 
I'm probably going to be animating on not object one because that's the base of it there. So probably these object two, three, four, maybe the shade a bit. So we can start on object two. Close this out. Press the um, S key at you know maybe it's going to be another two second animation, and maybe it's just some kind of he's just kind of being adjusted around a bit. So let's play that. So he's kind of just doing a dance too, just wobbling around. Maybe a computer's adjusting, uh, uh, the robot's adjusting it. Let me del actually delete these keys and maybe just do like one. Maybe he's, he's being set. Uh, maybe just in the beginning of the animation. I guess you copy this key and place it back here like, um, He's just being set. That bottom joint is just moving and, and being placed back into position. And maybe the next one, he animates a little, just in this little area, goes that way. Move a little bit later on in the timeline and maybe in, this guy inhibits this area. And then the shade at the end. So it's like each joint will move. Um, you got this one moving, this one, and then going up. So two seconds seems to be a little bit long for this. So I could actually um, go into the dope sheet. And he's great for um, scaling out animations. So right now I just have the lamp shades bone selected. Let me select all the bones. You can select the root, and that's like selecting. Um, uh, oops, my fault. Works a little different. I guess select all the objects for the dope sheet. I can kind of frame them up, and you see all the animation that's going on. It's a great thing is you can drag and select all. Press the R key, and I can drag it out. You see that my animation is now playing longer. So I could maybe drag it out to here, which is 72 frames. But then I got to open up my timeline, you know, to see it. Um, so let me hide this vase right now so I don't have like um, two things animating might be confusing. So you see this is now a 72 frame animation and I'm just animating, animating it from this joint, this joint, this joint up the joint chain and um, is kind of a three frame animation. I can kind of hide the joints, turn off wireframe and look at it a bit. And he's kind of just, uh, kind of just animate on each of these different joints. So that looks good. Um, actually, I'm going to bring back the vase, which I hid, display show selection. And now the vase is a two second animation while the lamp is a three second animation. So maybe I can move the vase out to three seconds or whatever. They both have um, different timing, you know, so that's fine. Um, but due to the length of this video, let me just say, okay, I did a hard surface animation on this one and a soft surface on this one. I'm going to say I'm done for now actually. I'm going to take the computer monitor and the wall art and actually just move them back into the room. Um, so now we have our, we have, let me save this file. All right, so now we have one, a vase SK, a lamp SK, and their actual animations, and the room static mesh in this file. And then in the next part of the video, I'm going to show you how to create the kind of the placement bones <coughs> that will be with the room, uh, and then how to export out all the files. All right, so now we have our master animation file that has our room, which is our static mesh version of our room, non-animating, it's our environment. We have our 
skeletal mesh of our lamp, uh, I'm sorry, our, our vase and then our lamp. And when we press play, we have animations on them. So next thing we're going to look at doing is actually kind of cr um, creating a, a placement bone system around the room. Um, so it'd be easier, very easy in Unity to just pop your skeletal meshes right in the exact same place as they are here in Maya. So basically it's going to be like a bone system that's sitting inside your static mesh room here. There'll be a little bone system. And it's not actually skinned to anything. All it is is basically placement information. And you're actually just going to like constrain these roots to their placement bones where they sit underneath that root. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Um, so on the Maya side of things, we're going to create a root. Um, and it's going to kind of have, have a, a basic setup where there's going to be a root sitting, usually like in the center of the room or something. Um, <clears throat> and then placement bone shot out from it. So maybe we can go into the top down view here and I can get a view of my room. Use my joint tool and hold the X key and I could just snap it to the grid. This is more or less in the center of the room. And um, Um, uh, this is the lamp in the vase here that um, I've placed. Um, and I can hold the V key. Or I, I think I'm going to actually just snap the, the placement bones out here a bit. Um, let me just do one for now, actually. So what's important is that we have the one root with the one bone kind of here, it's sitting in the center of the room. And from this, we're going to shoot the placement bones off from where the, um, the skeletal meshes are. Um, this is also where you'll pop in the, um, the character skeletal mesh. If you are going to interested in animating the robot, we'll show you how to input them in the scene next week. And, um, actually his root will have a placement bone too. That way, when you bring in your character skeletal mesh with a, with an animation and your own objects, skeletal mesh that the characters interacting with the, their, their placement is exact it's the same in my as it will be in unity and so it actually looks like he's interacting with the object but anyway um this joint system for now we can leave it outside the room because we're, we're manipulating it right now um we can call it like bn it's my room um just give it uh this i guess the root of the room kind of sitting in the middle now this joint here is going to be the placement for this lamp. So I can uh, see it's a lamp 01 here. So I'll call it BN lamp. Um, actually, it's a BN, sorry, of the room. I then call it lamp 01 placement. Um, I'm going to actually say placement. And then say lamp one. Let me ex do this and explain it in a second. Um, so basically, you know, it's the the bone, the object that that bone is attributed to, and then that bone's purpose or name in the hierarchy. So you know, this is the bone system of the room, and here's the root, which is is just sitting in the middle of the room. And then um, this one is going to be the placement for the lamp. And the reason I said the placement first is it's easier to read is like this is a bone of the of the room it's kind of um purpose is is a placement bone of the lamp o one and so when we create many placements you can kind of um read it in that order and say okay these are all placement bones and they and you know this one has to deal with this um skeletal mesh or what have you so um i could manually move this bone to try and you know place it right at the root of the lamp or I could hold the V key and try and snap it there um, but the problem is is that there's a lot of vertices here um, um, from this mesh and then you say oh well I could uh, maybe just grab this bone system and the lamps bone system and I can hide everything else right 
and I could take this placement, hold the V key, and I could snap it right to the bone of the, the root of the lamp. That's one way to do it. Um, let me just move him off a bit, and let me show you another way. If the room is full of stuff and you can't really you know, use a snap tool to snap to that root, um, let me just show you the, another way as a constraint here. If you select the master than the slave, so I want to select the lamp root and then the placement for the root because I want him to control this bone. I want this bone to be placed where this bone is. And you can click the, the um, parent alignment. Uh, let me uncheck maintain offset. Basically, maintain offset says, you know, maintain where the, the translation rotation offset there is. And then he'll inherit, you know, his characteristics from him. But I don't want that. I want maintain offset off. And what it'll do is actually it'll pop him right into the place, the translation and rotation. So that's the other way to do it. Um, but once you do that constraint, and basically I, I don't want that constraint to be active uh, anymore, so I'm actually going to delete it. I'm basically just using that constraint to, to pop him into place. But um, just so you know that the, when the parent constraint is still active like this, um, these constraints act as... Um, kind of other controllers besides the bone hierarchy. So I could grab this lamp root. As I move him around, you notice that the placement bone is actually moving around with him. And actually, if I rotated this, the actual placement bone rotates along too because he has this parent constraint going on, which means however this bone gets manipulated, this guy inherits that same manipulation. So that means translation, rotation, scaling of changes he gets the same changes too um, so that's why it's good to have this constraint kind of active maybe I'm, I'm not happy placing the lamp and you know um, the lamp skeletal mesh around the room and it's real easy with this constraint active the placement bone here is actually coming along for the ride and he's just sitting there right where the root is so either way, there's two ways to use it. Um, if you did want to use a constraint like this, just make sure that when you're, you know, you're happy with the skeletal placement, uh, the skeletal mesh placement, go in here and delete this constraint because he's not needed anymore. So, you know, when I move this, you'll see that I move the lamp skeletal mesh again at it by his root. And you see that that placement bone is not moving with him because I deleted that constraint. Um, basically, you know, keep that. Let me undo and keep bring the constraint back, and keep that constraint active um, until you're happy with everything. Um, it's placement, but before you know, you're going to be baking out these FBX files. Um, it's better. It's a cleaner. You can keep them on. Um, in your master scene, but um, it's just a, a cleaner method that once you're done, you moved it where you need to, just delete it. Because when you create your files ready for the game engine, um, it's not the cleanest to have that constraint still in there. <clears throat> okay. So, the other thing to be um, aware of with this placement here is the other way I was talking about is if you just select the bones that you want to deal with and you hide everything else you know it's real easy to hold the v key and just snap that placement bone onto the root um, the only thing to be wary of is if this lamp root had any type of rotation on them like the placement bone here has a zero has a 90 degree and there's these rotation values here um, and you see that the lamp doesn't have any you know, you, um, you might have to enter in these rotation values manually. That's why it's good to um, use the constraint way, because let me show you if I take the master, the, the, the object that I want to control the other one, the master, and then control select the slave, the object that will get manipulated, go to my constraint, do the parent constraint, he will um, have 
both his translation and rotation values um, overdriven, basically. And that'll actually rotate them in the correct way that it needs to be. All right. So now I have a placement bone for my lamp. Um, I can go ahead and duplicate control D and what this will do is it'll give me a bone at, that's at the same hierarchy, the same level. It basically it's a sibling. It's right underneath the root, but it's not going to be a child of the lamp of this placement bone I just created. And I, I want that. I, you know, I don't want a child, I want a sibling actually, because this one I'm going to pull over here and he's going to be the placement bone for the vase here. So again, I can click the vase click this bone. Let me, let me name it real quick so that's not confusing. Vase 01. So click the vases root, click the placement for the vase, and again we'll go to constrain and parent constraint. And it just popped the <clears throat> placement bone right at the root. So again, I'll go in there and I'll just delete that place, that um, parent constraint. And now you see we have two placements, the, the vase and the lamp. So the other thing I wanted to do was um, we have these vase and lamps in each of the four corners of the room. and uh, But these over here happen to be static meshes. So I can um, take duplicate this uh, placement of the of lamp 01 and move him over here to this other lamp. Uh, again, I can do um, snap the vertex, or um, I could even move this, this, the uh, skeletal mesh over here and find the exact placement. But this one, I'm just going to move. I'm just going to rough it out. I'm kind of getting it in the center. It's already sitting on the, the floor, the ground plane correctly. So I don't have to worry about the Y. I just kind of move it where he's kind of sitting there. So this is, um, since in the game engine, I'm going to be able to read that this is a placement node for a lamp. I'll be able to populate the um, a duplicate of the skeletal mesh here, and he'll also be animating. Um, but I want to delete this static version of the lamp um, because you know I'm still going to cook out. Um, I'm still going to export out the static mesh version of the room, and if I had a static version of that lamp just sitting right here, you know, then I, I couldn't really place the skeletal mesh version there because then you have the static mesh sitting right on top of the, the skeletal mesh. You know, you have two lamps and one of them would be animating, one will just be sitting there. Um, so I'm going to delete the static version and then I'll recreate him in game with the skeletal version. That's why I, I, I created the placement here. So now when I export this out, this room out to put in the unity, I have this this node, this bone hierarchy, which actually gives me the information of where all my skeletal meshes are gonna be because they're separate files. You know, so I'm gonna lose that placement information right now. Um, but I'm going to save it, um, recreate that information right now so I don't you know lose it. So I'm gonna take the vase node right here. I'm going to place a node. I'm going to duplicate them. And I'm going to move them over and basically center them up on this vase right here. All right. And again, this is a static version of vase. He won't be animating, so I'm going to delete him. And if I pull out, you see now we have a nice little node network going on here that's indicating where two lamps and two vases are going to sit based on my naming conventions. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn around and I see that there's another vase and and lamp over in this corner. So basically going to duplicate these vase and lamp nodes, <coughs> placement bones, duplicate them. See now I have lamp 03, vase 03. It's so very important to have unique names. That's why we have the serial numbering going on at the end. So I'm going to move them down, <clears throat> get an initial placement going on. And I'll select that vase frame up here. Kind of getting 
get them sitting just right. You can also do a top down view. Might be good to frame up here a bit, see what's going on. You know, since we're doing top down, I could just drag it and move it and not have to worry about, you know, uh, the, a Y value because it is just sitting on the ground, you know. All right, so I can take this vase and this lamp that are static meshes and delete them. And again, I can duplicate their nodes and move them out. Go into top-down view. Seems pretty handy. So let's see, this is the lamp. He's actually going over here. This is the vase. He's going about there. And again, I can delete them. All right. So I pull out, you see I have um, my placement information for four vases and four lamps that will be skeletal meshes. Basically, all f du four, four will be du you know, duplicates of these right here that will be animating. All right. So now I have my bone. This is my placement bone hierarchy, right? It has my information where I'm placing my skeletal meshes in my room. I want to actually move that into the Eric room here. So now it's it's nice and grouped up within this room. All right, so with that, I'm going to save this master scene that has information on our static, you know, our room, which is a static mesh, and our, our two skeletal meshes, the lamp and the vase, which we'll duplicate out a few times within the room. So now let's talk about how to um, export out all these files. Um, Deal with animation last. All right, so the easiest one is the room, which is all grouped together. You see it, it contains all the room uh, geometry plus this placement node network in the middle here. And I'm going to go File, Export Selection, right? Which means I'm basically going to create an FBX file only of what I have selected. You know, which was very easy to select all the static mesh of the room, uh, along with the placement bone hierarchy, because I had everything grouped together. So here I, I have this Unity room folder. Here's Eric room, Unity ready. And um, I'm going to create an FBX export out of it. I'm going to use the preset of just Autodesk Media. It's the best for us right now. And just export out the selection. And again, since I did export selection and not export all, all it exported out with the, was this group here, was which was our room. So now I have to create the skeletal mesh file for the lamp and the vase, and then the animations for the two. So um, it's actually easier to work um, backwards, meaning. Um, Let's create the animation files first, and then let's create the skeletal mesh. And, and you'll see why when I get there. So um, first off, I have the lamp and vase animations. If you remember, they are um, playing at different um, frame sizes. I think the vase had a 48, uh, second, 48 frame animation and the lamp had a 72 frame animation. But if you're not sure, the easiest way to, to do that is to um, select all the bones in, in whichever hierarchy. So it looks like right now we're gonna work on the lamp. Um, let me open him fully up and select all his bones so that um, we can see where the last key is on the bones of this object. So we know how big he is. Because um, you know that we moved our timeline, so I'm not really sure um, which is what. So if I uh, look here, I see that my animation starts at frame one. And if I select these over here, you see that the animation ends at frame 71. Even if I didn't move the timeline here, if I just select these end ones up here, you see it says stats. This is the frame. And that happens to be the value. So 
this is saying it ends at frame 71. Also, you could just drag your timeline. You see this red marker line is moving. And I'm at frame 71. Let me show you in the dope sheet too. Same thing really applies. I could frame up everything. And you see that these here are at frame one. It also says it up here, frame one. Um, I can let me shrink this down a little bit so you can see the the main timeline that happens to be down here. And then you see the last frame is here, which happens to be frame seventy one. Just make sure um, that you frame up. So, I mean, if I was looking at this a little differently, maybe if I had my timeline a little um, changed, you could see that, like, if I just looked at this quickly, I grabbed this one and said, oh, this is frame one. And I grabbed this one and said, oh, this is like frame 44. You know, oh, my, this animation on this object is only 44 frames long. Well, just make, you know, that's not real. Just make sure you frame up here first. And that shows you all the keys. Oops. That shows you all the keys on that object. So right now it's empty because I, I clicked off the uh, nodes. So again, using either the graph sheet or the dope sheet is the best way. Just make sure you frame up. Select the objects, frame up, and you'll see your whole entire animation for that object. Because you'll have a few objects animating in this scene. So you're not. it's going to be hard to create um, animations you know, for each one. So if we're focusing on the lamp here, it's a, a cycling, it's a looping animation that's about 71 frames long, all right? So um, let me close these for a second. You can see here, it goes from one to 72. Well, our last frame is actually 71. <clears throat> so oops. let me just change our timeline, it's important to have your timeline set to the exact frame of your animation. So the keys on this lamp for the loopable animation go from frame one to frame 71. Now I have to go into my main timeline in Maya and make sure that's set, frame one, frame 71. And so now my timeline is the entire size of the animation. I'm not clipping off any of my animation and I'm not just sitting there it doing nothing. So let me just say if I do 100, right? And if I click play, all right, and they just, they just stop. Cause they, you know, this is his animation playing to 71. Then we have like 30 frames where he's just standing still. So you're gonna get that in the game engine, right? So if you're creating loop animations, it's not gonna look right. Just make sure your timeline is set to the exact size of the animation, which happens to be 1 to 71. All right. Um, now we have the timeline set. So we're good to export out the lamp animation. So to do that is you select the entire um, joint hierarchy of the lamp. And you see that there's keys down here. And you see that, you know, the stuff's keyed up and your timeline is set correctly. And again, we're just going to do that file, export selection. Um, and just when you create your animation files, make sure that you only have the bone structure. That's all you need. It's basically just animation um, information on how these bones are animating, moving. Their attributes are changing over time. And then um, Unity can will attribute that, will connect it to the skeletal mesh, which will contain both the geometry and the bone structure. So the bone structure is just telling the geometry how to animate. And the animation files are just the bone structures with the animation data. So right now we're just creating the animation file for the loopable animation of this lamp. So I selected, I got my timeline appropriately set up, selected all my bones that are, have animation on them, do export selected. Again, we're doing export selection because we're going to create an FBX file of just that bone structure of that lamp SK, <clears throat> skeletal mesh. So again, to create animation files um, in Unity, the best way to do it 
you don't have to do this. It's just it's easier for Unity to read it, and it'll it'll present you with the animation files that are connected with that skeletal mesh. So it's the name of the skeletal mesh, which for us we have naming conventions like SK underscore Lampo one. That's the name of the skeletal mesh, and then the ampersand, the at symbol, tells you need is an animation file. Um, and um, usually I'll say, okay, it's a technical animation, it, meaning animation technical, AT underscore, and then I actually name the object LAMP01. And then um, whatever the name of the animation, this is just like a test loop animation, so I'll just say a loop animation. But you would name, you, this is where your animation name would be. So it's the, um, the skeletal mesh name, the ampersand signed, um, and then basically um, this gets trimmed out and gets um, hidden from you in Unity. So that's why I say, that's why the naming convention follows here. This is saying it's an, a technical animation, meaning it's an animation on like a, on a hard surface object. It's, it's not like a character animation. It's the name of the object. Lamp one, and then what the animation act, what the action is, the name of the animation. So I can export this out, and that was the animation for this lamp. Now let's go ahead and create the animation file for the vase. Um, actually, before we do that, let's create the SK for the lamp. Um, all right. So the reason I'm doing the SK last is because the the skeletal mesh. The reason I'm doing the skeletal mesh last is because I can't have animation on that skeletal mesh's bone structure, or else you're you know you can't swap animations in and out on top of that skeletal mesh's bone structure if there's already animation on that bone structure. So skeletal mesh files cannot have animation on it. You know, it's a blank template for it to read animations. It's just the geometry and the bones and how those bones get, are supposed to, you know, control the geometry, the skinning. No animation. So now that I, that's why I do the animation files first, because now I'm going to delete the animation and I'm going to create the skeletal mesh file. So while I have all the bones selected of the lamp, I know that all the animation is on these bones for the lamp, so I have them all selected. I can just so easily say edit, keys, and delete keys. So look at the bottom timeline, you'll see that they're red ticks, and off on the right hand side in the channel box you see that the attributes are red. But once I click delete keys, you see all the keys went away down the timeline and these attributes are not red anymore, meaning I deleted all the keys on the lamp bones. So now I can control and click the geometry of the lamp. So right now I have the geometry of the lamp clicked, selected, and all of the bones of the lamp selected. And now I can say File, Export Selection, and I'm going to create the FBX file for the lamp's skeletal mesh. And remember, there's no, bo no animation on a skeletal mesh. That's why the animation is separate. We already exported it out. <clears throat> and now we're creating the skeletal mesh with the naming conventions of SK underscore lamp 01. And that's it. Because the animation name, remember, is much longer. We have the name of the skeletal mesh, the ampersand sign, and then the name of the animation. And so we're naming this, making sure to name the skeletal mesh with that the exact same beginning as the animation name because now in Unity it'll be able to say, oh, this is the an animation that's attributed, that's connected to this skeletal mesh because we use the same naming conventions. So export selection. All right, now we're done with the lamp. We, we just created the skeletal mesh file of the lamp with both the geometry and the, the bone structure. And we, we created its loopable animation by just exporting out the bones that had a animation on it and the timeline correctly the same size as the start and end of the animation. 
And then remember, we deleted that animation to create the skeletal mesh. So let's move over to the vase. <clears throat> um, I can see with the red ticks down here that it looks like the animation stops around here. But something that don't always take that, you know, as the um, as reality, because there could be more keys that are way off past 71 um, for this animation. So always go into your graph editor or your dope sheet. Um, the dope sheets usually is is rather convenient for this kind of stuff. Um, because that's all it really does. It just shows you where the keys are on the timeline. It doesn't give you any more information than that. It's not like the graph editor where you can see the curves of the animation and everything. So again, I, I click the object bone of the vase. Uh, but if you're not sure where the animations reside on the bone structure, just remember to select the entire bone structure. Um, just because there's some bones that might have animation that goes beyond out, you know, beyond what what bones you clicked, and so you're going to be clipping off that animation. So let's frame up. Remember to frame up, and it'll show you your start and end keys of your animation so you know exactly where your animation starts and ends. And it looks like there's no animation on the root, and the animation on the object bone starts at frame 1, and it goes to about frame 48. And again, if I select this key here, it'll tell me that it's on frame 48. Okay, so I know... And also by dragging here, you see it's on frame 48. So I type 48 in here, but remember you have to type it into both of these to make sure that your timeline is appropriate, the scaling. So I can close the dope sheet out, and you see that this is going to be the wobble. You see as I drag the timeline that the lamp isn't animating, and that's because we deleted the keys on the lamp. So now we're all left with this uh, vase that's animating. All right. I can just select the bones on the vase and go File, Export Selection. And we have the bones with the timeline set appropriately to start an animation with animation on the bones. So we must be creating an animation file. And again, that's going to be the name of the skeletal mesh, which is SKVAS01. The ampersand sign AT for a technical animation. Call it VAS01, which is the object. And it's a loop animation. I can save this out. While I have the bones selected, I can go edit, keys, delete keys. No animation. I can control select the mesh. So now I have the mesh and the bones of the vase skeletal mesh all selected. I can say edit, export selection. <clears throat> and this is going to be called SK underscore vase 01, which is the exact same beginning as the animation name. So that Unity reads it and export that now. Do not save the master scene. If I saved it, my master scene right now, I deleted the animations that are on these two objects. So I went through and I exported out all my files I'm going to use in Unity, but I made sure I saved this master scene before I did that because that all the the information in that master scene was updated and correct. You know the skeletal mesh. Objects were animating. I put, created my placement bone system. It's great. And then I went through and created the static mix version of the room, the animation file for the lamp, the skeletal. I deleted the animation to create the skeletal mesh, created the vase animation, deleted that animation on the bones to create the skeletal mesh. And now I export out everything, but I'm not, you know, my animation is deleted, so don't save that master scene now. Now you can like reopen it or, you know, I happen to be done in Maya right now. Um, so what we're going to do now is move on into Unity. <coughs> um, and we're going to set up these, these um, skeletal meshes in the room. Alright, so
So let me show you in the file manager here. These are the exact files I created. The Unity, uh, the, my, the Eric Room Unity Ready, the LAMP SK, the LAMP animation, the Vaz SK, and the LAMP animation. So I'm just going to drag these all into my project here. And then I can actually just drag them into the hierarchy to see them in the scene. So now that I dragged my room in, you can see I have my root structure here. So if I do want to drag in the lamp, <clears throat> first off, let me, um, in the project lamp, there's some uh, updates I can do. Everything looks pretty good. I can drag him into the scene and let me frame up on him and you see this was his position uh, when I exported him out but now I can um, bring him up and place him underneath these placement bones for these lamps and as I drag him in again Okay, when I brought the lamps into Unity, I realized that they were um, being moved off from where they should be, and they are being um, rotated. And actually, there's a few things. Um, there's actually one thing I forgot to do when exporting out these lamps. So, our, our NES skeletal mesh, I should say. So, I'm going to actually go into my Unity scene, and I'm going to delete these lamp skeletal meshes that I brought into the room here, um, I'm going to leave them in the project because when I update them, you'll see that Unity will actually read the updated files or notice that there's a change. So I'm going to go back in here. Now there's nothing, um, there's actually a, two, a few things I got to update here. I noticed on my placements when I was placing them, um, that they had uh, rotation information on them. Well, you see that the root has no rotation. Um, but the, um, the placements do. Um, so I guess somehow with the um, constraints, the parent constraint, maybe it didn't... Um, didn't set the rotations or I forgot to do that so actually I'm going to go through and just zero out the rotations here on these placement bones because um, that's one mistake I did um, if you know oops, zeroed out that scale let me just go through and zero out these rotations all right I must have cut the one. One of them must have been rotated, and then I kind of copied out the rotation information, I guess. Um, but what's supposed to happen is, <clears throat> let me go into this uh, lamp root. His whatever his translation and his rotation information should be on that placement bone. So for this lamp here, we have this translation information, and we had that type of rotation information going on there. So. <clears throat> Uh, let me just zero out that rotation information. That was one issue. So I went through my placement bones. I removed that rotation information. So now that I updated my um, my room again, my room uh, static mesh again, I have to go through and I, I selected my room static mesh and uh, I'm going to export it out. So this file, all right, now um, 
the animation is not on these objects again because I went through, you know, and I deleted the animations. Um, so like, let me just reopen my master scene. And I'm going to open up the version I saved that actually had the, the animations on those objects. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have animations on those objects. I did export out my FBX to that room, but um, I didn't save the changes in that room. So I'm just going to zero out these rotations. Let's see if I can select them all and just zero out that rotation. All right, that did work. Zeroed all that rotation. <clears throat> the animations on those objects. So let me just save the master scene. All right, so I already exported out the updated static mesh of the room. Now, what I forgot to mention was that um, when you're ready to kick out your static mesh versions, of the skeletal mesh actually they need to be zeroed out um, because you're going to place them in the scene on their placement bones um, that the you know that are in this room here so what actually what i brought in is i saved out these these um, skeletal meshes and their animations that had already had information on the root there that they translate and rotate um, so that was a goof. So basically what needs to happen is, so say if I'm going to work on the lamp, I have to zero out that translation. I, he needs to be at world space zero. So um, if this room is kind of distracting you and I can hide it, and you see that this lamp is sitting at world space zero. So we have his, his root. His translation is zero. The rotation is zero. And again, he was, um, I believe it was 71 frames for his animation. So I'm just going to select his root structure and uh, export selected. And here's his name his animation file great now while the bones are selected I'm gonna delete the keys uh, that was something interesting to note you notice how he's still bent a little bit I was actually on frame 68 when I delete those keys so always make sure you go back to frame one you know when you want to create that skeletal mesh or else I was kind of stuck in a pose that was on frame 68 so let me delete those keys everything looks great I'll click the mesh <clears throat> and uh, let's see, export selected. And uh, this is the skeletal mesh of the lamp I'm exporting. All right, I'm done with the lamp so I can kind of hide him. Um, so now we have the vase to deal with. So again, I got to delete out or zero out his translation. And if he had rotation, zero that out too. Have him sitting right at world space zero. <clears throat> his animation went to frame 48. This is just, you can go back and, um, oops, you can go back. And previously in the video, I showed you how to check. You know, I, I went through the hype, um, the graph editor and the dope sheet, and I found out that his, his animation was 48 frames long. So again, I could select his bones and do file export selection. And I'm going to save out or export out an FBX version of the vase animation. Then I'm gonna, you know, make sure I'm at frame one. 
so that the um, he's in his default pose. I have his bones selected. I go edit keys, delete the keys off. S control select the uh, mesh export selection. <clears throat> and I'm going to save out the static mesh of the vase. All right. I had all my files exported out. Just in case, I'm going to um, drag them back in again. Okay, two versions. Let me just delete everything. All right, I'm going to delete the, the room in the hierarchy too. Let's just start fresh. When you, um, I'm just dragging these files into the Unity um, scene, but actually if you copy these files over and you're actually working from within your Unity project, like these FBX files are within your Unity project, um, they'll notice the, the update. So I'm just kind of doing this quickly, doing this video, but if I set the Unity project up correctly and had these files in there, it would have read them and saw that there were changes. So anyway, I popped to my room in. So <clears throat> within the room, let's try this again. If I open up in the, the hierarchy, the uh, version of the room, here's my bone systems, and I can select my lamp, drag them into the placement of lamp one. Now that we have a lamp in that corner, let's see if I drag the lamp onto placement two. All right, there we go. I have the lamp in the other corner. And again, I can drag them onto placement three. And here's the lamp in the, the, the third corner. And I'll rotate the view. And when I drag the lamp SK onto the fourth, there he is. All right. So we have the four lamps in the room. Um, if I click on one, open them up. Um, you can see that the, the animations that they have clicked on here. I can open this up. You see that it's the loop animation and when I click on it, it highlights in the project that this loop animation. So it actually read, you know, it actually connected up my animation already. I didn't have to manually do it. To do it manually, you click on the circle here and you go through the animations and select the one that you want that's available in the Unity project. So due to my naming conventions, it actually read my animation. Um, I want to select the, the animation file in the project. Oops, I double clicked it. It's going to open it in Motion Builder too. Is that what I wanted? Be careful about that. Just single click it. Um, a few things. Um, when you bring your animation in, make sure animation wrap mode, loop it. Um, so that it plays over and over again. In this keyframe reduction, turn it off. It can make your animation look bad. And just click apply. So now that is applied to all the um, to all the animations. So all these loopable animations are going to be playing on all these lamps. Um, let me quickly show you. Actually, let me. Uh, yeah, let me quickly show you the, the animation menu. If um, you're having problems like playing the game, this is actually a great way to uh, just test out your animations without having to click play to jump in the game. So I have this lamp selected and you see that the animate the loop animation is connected to it. And you can click play and you see that it'll play my animation on the lamp. So you're actually testing out the animation without, without having to jump into the game. So it's a good way to just make sure that your animations are working on your skeletal meshes. All right. So let's bring the vases in. So let's close up our bone structure here, our placement bone structure. Um, let me turn my view around where the, um, oops, the first vase will sit. Um, also, you see that these vases look a little weird. That's because their normals are uh, reversed. I'd have to go in there and flip the normals. Good. That's why it's good to bring your files in the 
Unity and see that the issues. So let me drag the vase, and you see that he got populated in his uh, correct spot. I'll drag the next one onto the second placement bone. See, he got populated in. And bring vase onto placement three and placement four. And now you see, I'll close up these bones again. Now you see we have all four of our skeletal meshes, actually eight, four vases and four lamps. I, I basically just dragged and dropped them into the scene, you know. Otherwise, if you drag them into the scene, they'll just randomly, maybe they might be at world space zero. And, you know, you have to move them back to where you had them in Maya. This way, they're exactly where they were. Uh, let me just check the vase animation again. Oops, still clicked it. Do the wrap mode of loop and turn off keyframe reduction again. And I'll click apply to get rid of that. You don't want them. Um, great. Now um, we have all our assets in the room. We could click play. Um, but real quick. I didn't actually create um, a, uh, a first-person controller. So let me run that through again. I, I clicked my room, click uh, Generate Colliders, um, Asset, maybe just make a quick uh, game object, create other directional light. Just bring in a directional light into the scene. Just have some type of lighting so it's not very flat. <clears throat> All right. Now we're missing, uh, I got the standard assets here. If you don't see those, go to Assets, Import Package, uh, Character Controller here. And we have the first person controller. We can drag that into our room here. And we can go find him. He's going to be way off. So in the position here, zero him out. And uh, click on him. And he's going to be where the room is, but he's way too big. I didn't actually scale my room. Um, first person controller is set up to be um, two meters, around six feet or so. So you know your scale is good if you can pop in that first person controller and he just sizes up correctly with your scene. But for me, I'm going to scale him up, kind of sit him correctly. Um, also, I went through in the previous videos, I'm going to slow down his speed by like 10 times because I know that my, my room is so small. So if I click play, oh, also you, you see that his, um, his camera, right, let me stop this for a second. All right, if you open this up and click on his camera perspective, you'll see that the, um, our clipping is bad because it's so small. So our near clip plane has to be really small to accommodate that. Um, if you do notice that, it's the clip planes, the near and far, if your scaling is a little different. So as I walk around my room here, oops, you see that I got the vase and lamp animating over there. I got the vase and lamp animating in the other corner. And if I turn around, I got the vase and lamp animating in the third corner. And here in the fourth corner, I have the vase and lamp animating again. So I was able to duplicate out this, these skeletal meshes all over the room and do the placement bones. You know, I was able to position these skeletal meshes in exactly the locations they were in my Maya scene. And so I was able to duplicate out these skeletal meshes and reuse you know, these skeletal meshes with their animations on them and kind of have a room full of animating objects. So for this week, um, if you could take those animations, those three objects that you created, um, and follow these videos, you know, and you can um, create skeletal mesh versions of them, the, the files, the skeletal mesh file, and then the animations. And actually, you can um, update your room, your static mesh, with the placement bone structure, and uh, you and by figuring out where you want to duplicate out these skeletal meshes throughout your room, you know, you would create this placement bone structure. So it's really easy to just duplicate these objects multiple times throughout your room. Um, 
And so that will be your assignment for this week. Just refine your animations for those objects and then create the skeletal mesh files, the animation files, and your static mesh room and bring everything into Unity and test it and make sure that everything is, is playing correctly. Thank you. Also, a, a real quick, uh, I wanted to show you how to take play best blast videos out of Maya and also how to take uh, recordings um, for showing video of um, your animations in Unity. So in Maya you can take play blast videos out um, by framing up your your camera into where your action will be and then playing the animations. So let me make sure that my playback speed is real time under my settings. And you see that now they're playing what the real time is. They, they were sped up before. Um, that was here under this button for preferences. So now I have my timeline set for 72 seconds, 71 seconds, which is for the lamp. You notice that he's kind of um, stops for because his animation stops around 48. So it's usually it's better to create a, a video of each object separately. So let me like hide the vase. And um, I can just show my lamp animating for this video. So let me get the camera zoomed up on him. Make sure my frames are correct, right? The, the start and end of the animation. And then go to Window, Play Blast, and the options here, we can reset them. Your time range is going to be your time slider, this down here. And you, um, this is correct, your format is you want QuickTime, QT. The problem is that the, uh, the AVI format is, it makes such huge file sizes for the internet. If you don't have the QT format, you have to install QuickTime on your computer. If you don't have, you know, I know a very few of the students are having issues with installing QuickTime, then um, let me show you the second way to do it a little later. Anyway, select QuickTime. MPEG-4 um, is a good compression. You get good quality and good compression. You leave quality at 70, display size from window, just meaning what's in your window here. Scale it down 50%. Um, save to file you know create your file so this is my lamp loop animation then you click browse and find a folder where you would place this so in here is fine um, oh, got. I guess you got to put the file name in here instead. Um, so that was lamp loop animation. Click save. And you can uh, play blast it. All right. So it just recorded the video, and if you just give it a second. It should pop up in QuickTime. Here it is. And you can click play. And there's my animation. And you can actually go view and click loop, click play, and then you'll it'll actually loop your animation, your video over and over again. So if the video is the exact size of your loopable animal loopable animation, you know, then by your video looping you'll be able to you should be able to see a smooth loopable animation. And if you don't, then you know that something was off and you should create your video again. And this is what you can upload to um, you know the online uh, uh, assignments for review and grading. Now in Unity you know I, I can click play and I can walk around in my room and see the objects animating. <coughs> um, but I don't have this play blast feature. Um, but let me unclick play and Camtasia let me show you the website oh, no, no, sorry not Camtasia I use Camtasia but, but you have to pay for that use a cam studio it's for free it's camstudio.org 
and then you can go down to scroll down to the bottom here and you can download download from SourceForge. So Cam Studio is a free version of a screen capture recording. So you click the red button here to, to record. You know, so you move it off to the side, you jump into Unity, click play in Unity, and you can click play here in Cam Studio, and you can actually record you what you're seeing in Unity Unity. So also um, you know uh, create videos out of Unity too. Those will be for the projects to make sure that your stuff is is working within Unity. And for those of you who have are having issues with Play Blast in Maya, or you know you can't get this, the QuickTime option of Play of um, Play Blast, try out Cam Studio within Maya too. Um, so the big thing is, you know, if you have dual screen, just choose your region. You'll drag out the region that you want Cam Studio to record. And then in options, um, yeah, audio is not a big concern. Um, you can just try this Microsoft Video One. It's at least this has a somewhat good codec compression for AVI, um, so you'll get better, much smaller files than if you did AVI out, uh, straight out of Play Blast. So use the Cam Studio here, um, definitely for doing videos out of Unity to show your animations in Unity. Um, and it's a good backup if you have any issues with, with play blasting in Maya. Thanks.